I, I'm not sure what the word spiritual means, but there always was a need in me to tell the story, to know the story uh, of the universe and why it existed and how it existed. Um, one reason was that I wanted to know what we're doing here. I wanted to have a sense that life in general and human life in particular fits in somehow. And so that sense of wanting a story which is complete and which gives us a coherent existence in the world was always very strong with me. Hmm. The future is to some extent repeatable and to some extent predictable, but not necessarily totally. There's room for novelty and there's room for surprise. And I think that that gives a picture of the world in which human aspirations about the future can fit in much better than the picture in which will, experience, time, qualia, all these things, imagination, are all in some sense illusions because everything is just already determined. And when systems are far from thermodynamic equilibrium, but driven by flows of energy through them, they have a tendency to organize themselves to develop self-organization. And this doesn't contradict the second law of thermodynamics because the second law of thermodynamics, which says that entropy increases and disorganization increases, applies to systems that are isolated and don't have flows of energy therefore running through them. Because the universe is full of stars, which drive a lot of hot photons into cold space, there's a lot of systems like the surface of the Earth, which are these kind of open systems which have energy flowing through them. And there have been different versions of this principle that a system out of equilibrium with the flow of energy through it develops complexity and organization. And that explains the growth of complexity of life, that explains the growth of complexity of galaxies, because galaxies are also systems which are driven by flows of energy through them. Um, then you want to, if you want to keep going, you can ask, but why are there stars? Say, the gas in a room, when it comes to equilibrium, it has the same temperature and same density everywhere in the room. Um, a system that is dominated by gravitational forces, like a solar system or like a galaxy, doesn't behave that way. It, when it develops in time, its entropy increases, but in a way that leads to a great asymmetries to develop, that allows great asymmetries to develop, that allows great amounts of inhomogeneity to develop, and allows structure and complexity to develop. The initial conditions of the universe have to have been very special, and indeed, it was by observation, we know that they were very special. We know the entropy was extremely low in the very early universe, which means that the level of organization coming out of the Big Bang, whatever the Big Bang was, was extraordinarily high. The human capacity to imagine the future is vastly underappreciated. And the human capacity to invent new experiments, new, there's new experiments of social organization, of organization of governments, of organization of businesses, of ways of seeing society and ourselves, of novel solutions to problems that face us. The, all these capacities are vastly underappreciated and underutilized in the present political systems. You know, when I wrote The Trouble with Physics, I was concerned with the general issue of takeover of a field of investigation prematurely by a paradigm. And I was concerned that there's not enough investment in diverse approaches to unsolved problems. And I use as my case study my own field of physics because I could develop the case study in detail. But I heard from many people in many different fields after the book was out that this phenomena that I was concerned with, these, these issues, were very evident in their field as well. And I heard from no field stronger and louder than from economists that there are issues in the field of economics with the dominance by a failed 
but dominant mainstream economic theory, which already, since the early 1970s, the literature has been full of an understanding of its limitations and what's needed to go beyond it. We were moved by concern with the crisis in 2009 to have a conference on the economic crisis, not as an economic issue, as a, not as a practical issue, but as a crisis of the science of economics, as an intellectual and scientific crisis. And it's pretty easy to locate the cause of the crisis and the insufficiency of the standard of the governing economic models, economic theory, um, sometimes called the neoclassical model, and various financial models and models of markets that come from it. And the issue is the role of time. Um, these models of markets um, demonstrate, and this is the key result in them, that there are points of equilibrium where market forces are balanced, where sellers and buyers are equally happy. And in these points of equilibrium, you can't make anybody happier or better off without making somebody else less happy or less well off. These are so-called Pareto equilibrium points. And then an enormous mistake is made in much of the discourse, and as far as I can tell, it's just a mistake, to assume that these are unique, that in any given market there'll be one such equilibria. If that were the case, and it's often argued from the assumption that that's the case, then the best thing to do for society, for everybody across society, would be to have no regulation, as minimal government interference, minimal government involvement in markets, and let the market find that equilibrium because by the mathematical theorem, what a wonderful thing, a mathematical theorem guaranteeing that if you just relax all the regulations and government involvement, everybody will be as happy as possible. The problem is that economists have known since the early 1970s in their own literature that these, even on the terms of these models, which may very well not be correct anyway, or completely correct, the equilibria configurations are highly non-unique. And that means several things. One of them is it means that there's a vast array of possible equilibria where market forces are balanced. So market, but the conditions are very different. In some of them we have very unequal societies, and other societies are more equal. Some of them we have dominance of every sector by one firm as a monopoly, and others there's a, a healthy sense of competition amongst different firms in a given market. Um, and therefore the choice of what conditions we want to live in, how stable, how unstable, how fair, how unfair, um, how balanced, how unbalanced, is a choice that society has to make through law, through ethics, through regulation of markets. All these have a place, even on the standard model, to pick which equilibrium you're in. The second consequence is that real markets don't, don't just go to an equilibrium and sit there. They spend time moving amongst equilibria, and they are, therefore, markets and economies are path-dependent and history-dependent and time-dependent. A lot of the debate, such as it is about climate change, turns on two false issues, as far as I can tell. One of them is the issue of how predictive are the models of the climate going ahead into the future? There are certainly large uncertainties. There are large uncertainties in the science, and there are large uncertainties in what drives climate change, which is the human economy and human activity putting carbon into the air. Okay. So there's an argument which I think is very irresponsible that if we're not sure what's going to happen, we shouldn't act because it will cost whatever it is, a few percentage of GNP to act decisively on this. And this is misunderstanding the role of prediction and the role of the future, how we should see the future. In fact, because there is a wide range of possible outcomes, we should be prepared for all of them. We should see climate change not as an ecological problem, not as an environmental issue, which is not, it's neither of those, because it's not about the environment, it's not about preserving anything. 
It's about preserving human society at a high level of wealth, equitably for everybody in the world. If we didn't care about that, we could just go back technologically and have a few rich people in a few rich countries and there wouldn't be an issue about climate change. So climate change is an economic issue and it's, if anything, a national defense issue and should be approached as a national defense issue, which means there should be contingencies for a range of unknown futures, assuming that the future is unknown. We should ask the question, what might develop and what can we do now that will prepare our societies in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years to make decisions in response to whatever develops. Now it has to be said also that the range of possible futures is not comforting. I mean, it, is, you know, it ranges from 2 degrees warming, which is already difficult and will compromise a lot of human hopes if not dealt with, and total catastrophe, 8 or 10 degrees warming. Um, so we shouldn't be um, we, we shouldn't be comforted by that uncertainty because clearly what's happening is that human economic activity has gotten to the point where the ecological cycles that balance the climate and balance the conditions on the planet are impinged on by our own activity, by our own cycling of materials and our own input of materials like carbon and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And so we're not going to back off of a high level of economic activity, a high level of energy usage, and therefore we have to treat the problem as one where we integrate the artificial and the natural. We have to do that responsibly, we have to do that carefully, we have to prepare well in advance, we have to be willing to experiment, because the future is uncertain. So I would like to make a call for us to free ourselves from rigid ideas about the distinction between the artificial and natural and rigid ideas about choices and choices that allegedly have to be made and develop a much more flexible and evolutionary approach to dealing with the challenges of climate change and being prepared for what may come.